Welcome to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. Legal issues simplified through real client stories and real world experiences. Creating simplicity in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. I'm your host, Berta Dotto, with my co host, Michael Bird. As a business and healthcare law firm, we meet a lot of interesting people and learn their amazing stories. Our clients commonly come to us with the latest word on the street that they heard from a friend. Brad, this season, we will talk about stories with a common legal urban legend and seek to either prove or disprove the legend. This season's theme is fake or real. That's awesome. Well, Michael, I'm kind of looking across me today. You look really well rested. Uh, the summer seems to be, I know we're almost done with it because we're in August now, but it seems to be suiting you well. Well, thank you for noticing, Brad. I'm recently back from a quick family vacation, and I'm actually feeling pretty good. Mm -hmm. I was last uh, weekend driving home from Austin, Texas, nice. and I noticed a pretty funny bumper sticker as we were passing through a particularly country portion of our state. Michael, are you saying that there might have been some rednecks around? Well, you know, that word does definitely paint a vivid and maybe accurate picture <laughs> of, of the area of Texas that we were in, but sure. anyway, to ca carry on the the visual that you've created with yeah. redneck, yes, my fault. Uh, the uh, I the bumper sticker was on the back of an old beat up pickup truck. Okay, and when I say bumper sticker, that's really not doing it justice. It was massive. It took up the entire rear windshield. Okay, uh, the first thing that caught my attention, other than the sheer size of it, was a massive silhouette of a cowboy riding a bull okay and uh, and which actually isn't that unusual yeah, sure for that area of our state but underneath it in large letters it said no texting and bull riding ah okay well that does remind me of some other uh, ones when i'm driving either west Texas and sometimes even East Texas that I've seen and i can't remember which side of the of the great state of Texas i was on when i saw it but one was Rub some dirt on it. Mm -hmm. uh, you oh, yeah. know, that seems like a good classic. And of course, the one that made me laugh and my wife um, gave me um, stink eye. I love big bucks and I cannot lie. Oh, well, that is like a double hit there. It's <laughs> both a dad joke and brings out your 13 year old humor. <laughs> yes, it did. All right. Well, I saw one uh, that uh, cracked me up because it, if you've ever had a friend that's vegan or crossfit you'll get this one yeah um, if you if the bumper sticker said if you meet someone who is vegan and into crossfit which one do they talk about first <laughs> <laughs> how about you do you have any favorite bumper stickers besides the uh big bucks one um you know i don't know if i have a favorite bumper sticker but I, I was driving behind a minivan once and on the bumper sticker it made me laugh it said i used to be cool <laughs> oh. I bet you resonated with that one. Uh, <laughs> I'm still cool. Well, all the ones I can think of are are really tap into my 13 year old boy humor. And even though Riley's not here, I don't want to disappoint her. We do have our podcast sensei Rob here, yes. and he probably would get into our 13 year old boy humor talk. But yeah, I'll pass for now. Well, I, I won't. Um, okay. Um, I, going back to my 13 year old humor, I actually remember the first time I saw this bumper sticker. And um, I'm not sure if I can actually say the word, so I'll try to spell it. It said, something happens with an SH, some type of uh, maybe an I with the followed by maybe a, a T, um, you know, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I remember driving with my dad laughing, and it's such a classic because I still thought it was perfect. Yeah, well, that that all makes sense, and I probably would have laughed too. Yes. Um I saw another one, uh, of course, also in a rural part of Texas on the back of an old pickup truck that said, uh, my son beat up your honor student. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of kids ones, I, I did see one where it said I, I childproof my car, but they still got in. Uh, OK, well, I've got a little, let's get a little more personal, Brad. OK. Do you have any bumper stickers on your car? None. No, none right now. Have you ever had bumper stickers on your car? I have. And, and so I guess depending on season of my life, I've had Saints bumper stickers. Mm. I've had Carry the Load bumper stickers, which is, for those who don't know, a nonprofit that we do a lot of work with uh, that helps bring back the true meaning of Memorial Day. 
Um, and then at different points in different cars, I've had my kids' schools logos uh, mm-hmm. on it. Um, well, how about yourself? I'm not a bumper sticker guy. Um, and I actually have gotten more anti bumper sticker over the years. It just is. Yes, we're talking about it now. Well, anti bumper sticker on my car. Oh, okay. I appreciate the bumper okay, sticker. Okay, got it. Just not on my car. It's too messy. And I think what really started getting me there is that I've got a, 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 a huge amount of kids, as you know, yes. five kids. And, uh, and so you can't keep up with all the different things oh, that sure. you could advertise. Yes. Um, and no, I did not carry the stick figure family on the back of my car with the, you know, five kids and all my, at 1.7 pets. Yes. Well, that'd probably be like that bull riding car. You saw that it would just take up the entire back windshield. Exactly. With your kids and pets. Exactly. Uh, well, it did. It did help me the fact that I'm anti bumper sticker on my car because my daughter Caroline gave me an Arkansas Razorback sticker for Christmas one year, and mm-hmm. it's still sitting in my closet. Oh, okay, at least you uh, throw it away. And so I feel okay about it because she understands that I'm not a bumper sticker guy. So yeah. it's not the fact that I don't want to put her bumper sticker on, but. To be fair, it is an Arkansas Razorback sticker, mm-hmm. and so I like having the reason that uh, not to put it on there because I, a good UT Longhorn would never have a Arkansas Razorback sticker on the back of his car. That makes sense. Um, now I know what to get you for Christmas, though. Mm-hmm. It sounds like I need to get a whole box of Texas A&M bumper stickers. Oh yeah, yeah, I would put them to good use. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a, a cousin to the bumper sticker, the personalized license plate. Just tell me you don't have a personalized license plate, Brad. Never have, um, but I guess it's cousin. I have had personalized um, holders of the license plates. And then shocking news, um, one said season ticket holder for the Saints, and the other one said uh, 2009 Super Bowl champs uh, with the Saints. So those are the, I guess it's a cousin to it. Yeah, sounds like it. Well, uh, I, for the most part, I don't like the attention that uh, it calls to people, but I did laugh really hard. I saw a lady driving a, a Porsche convertible that had personalized plates that said was his. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Yeah, that's no bueno. Okay, well, what does, uh, I guess, bumper sticker slash personal license plates have to do with fake or real today? Absolutely nothing. Oh, okay. Yeah. But we are going to be talking about the corporate practice of medicine, or CPOM, and I feel like there's a good bumper sticker or license plate that could be created for CPOM. Yeah, and um, you know, uh, as many of you know, Michael does have CPOM tattooed on his bicep, so that's probably why he thinks it's a good bumper sticker. Mm-hmm. But for those who don't know, the corporate practice of medicine is a state doctrine. It basically limits corporations from providing um, medical services and, and or um, employing physicians. And it is in every single state. Um, we've talked about this in other shows. It's a little bit different, but that's kind of a high level understanding of what CPOM is. Yeah. And so our question that we will dispel today, Brad, is about CPOM. And the question is this, fake or real, CPOM may affect the business structure of my medical spa. I think I know the answer, but let's get started with today's story. Okay. The main character in today's story is a prominent female facial plastic surgeon named Dr. Shirley Partridge. Okay, I'm putting on my thinking cap here, and I think um, you're you're you used to complain about my movie references. Now I think you're adopting that you like it because I'm thinking about a character from the 1970s TV show, The Partridge Family reference, and I like it. Ding, ding. And I think only two people in this room. No, maybe a third piece. And I'm, I'm looking at Rob in, in the in, in engineer seat. I bet you Rob knows it. Yeah. Uh, Cynthia, who's sitting in for Riley today. I don't think you've ever seen the Partridge family. She's shaking your head. No audience. Danny members. Bonaducci. I mean, yeah. OK. All right. <laughs> we got a thumbs up over there from Rob. <laughs> well, for those that do not know, the Partridge family was a TV show based on a family band. Shirley Partridge was the widowed mom. And she had a traveling band with her five children. Yeah. And I love that you're finally starting to understand the relevance of old movies and old TV shows. And the fact that you went back to the 70s, you make fun of me making using the 80s. But let's get back to our story. Does Dr. Partridge have a band with her family? No, Brad, we 
don't do a lot of band talk on our podcast. Okay. So yeah, Dr. Partridge sense. is uh, in our story is in, is widowed. Okay, actually. sorry to hear that. And uh, and she has three children of her own that work at her practice. Okay, Lori is a physician assistant at the practice. Okay, Suzanne is a registered nurse. Okay, and Keith is the CEO on the business side. He's not a, a practitioner. All right. Well, let's tell me there's someone to fill the shoes of Ruben, who was the Partridge family band manager. Yeah, you got to have a band manager. Yeah. So you'll be happy, Brad. Ruben, in our story today, actually, when Dr. Partridge first uh, was widowed and needed help at the practice, had hired Ruben to help run the business um, and had actually been there since Dr. Partridge first purchased the practice 25 years ago. And um, he's like family to them. Yeah, and the more I'm sitting here, Michael, wondering, um, are you secretly hiding the fact that we know you don't like bumper stickers, but maybe you're a Partridge family groupie and you're about to break into your first ever favorite Partridge family song here in the podcast? Uh, we we know that someone on our team here is guilty of breaking into song. And uh, if someone were to go back and listen they would discover that there is someone who has done that multiple times and it's not me. Oh, okay. Yeah. But so please don't. All right. Uh, well, back to the story. Then. Okay. Uh, so Ruben created um, the medical spa at the practice 20 years ago. And okay. side note, they didn't call them medical spas 20 years ago. No, they didn't. Um, and, uh, and has actually today, the medical spa side of this practice is making as much money as the surgical side. Okay. So let's, uh, when did or, or why did Dr. Partridge actually call you then? So after all this time building a successful business, Dr. Partridge was ready to scale. Okay. Well, you know, Michael, you know how much I love context, fake news. I uh, know you love context. Um, please let the audience know what does scale mean or scaling. Okay. Well, I'm, I like context so much. I got to give you context to give you the context about what scaling is. <laughs> okay. So, We've talked to, on other episodes about the seasons of a business. Every practice, every business is in one of four seasons. In our terms, we call it the building season. Yeah. That's the beginning. You're putting the infrastructure in place. And then you're in the operating season. That's the day-to-day -day grind of running your business and dealing with crises as they pop up. Mm -hmm. At some point, you may decide to go into the scaling season. And the scaling season is a time when there is a focus on accelerating the growth of the business. Sure. And uh, that may be creating a new revenue stream, opening new locations, or, you know, adding, um, you know, adding to your existing revenue streams in some, you know, strategic way that is, uh, you know, a focused effort to accelerate growth. And then, you know, as we talked about all last season, the, the fourth, uh, season of a business is the selling season, and it it is directly impacted by all these other sure. seasons. Yeah, the buying and selling season is an important aspect for a lot of individuals. So what was uh, Dr. Partridge's vision um, for why she would want to scale? Great question. So she was mostly thinking about creating flexibility and security for her eventual exit. So okay. she right. had family. She had three kids in her practice. Um, she had Reuben, which was relevant mm -hmm. and, you know, she wasn't getting any younger. She was the, the breadwinner for the practice. She was the surgeon with the skills. And so, uh, she, she really wanted to specifically grow the medical spa side and had a vision to open multiple lo new locations. Okay. And so did, why did she share? What well, did she share? I guess more importantly, what she wanted to do with this. Yeah, I mean, she wanted to uh, reward Ruben gotcha. for his loyalty, and yeah. she wanted to create a place for Lori, Suzanne, and Keith beyond her retirement. And uh, she had also kind of coincidentally identified a young surgeon that she was ready to hire to uh, help and eventually take over on the surgical side. Got it. So she basically, what I heard was her office manager, the PA, the RN, and the... Um, the CEO, all who are not physicians or individuals that she was trying to figure out ways to be a part of it. And um, and then more importantly, which I wanted to jump back into is this happens a lot, especially with our surgeons. They want to find ways to tap into the non-surgical revenue because it's more flexible. Mm -hmm. It's more repeatable. 
and and especially in for those who've heard us talk about this in the med spa world or, or we talked about it, especially during the hitchhiker's guide to m a um it's an ability for them to operate something that is not dependent on the surgeon in that case the physician from actually physically having to be in the med spa every day so it's a it's a it can be a, a win for them no absolutely and and you know, as a, she kind of presented this to me as a mm-hmm. footnote, but she, Dr. Partridge, was also curious about private equity, and so it was appealing to her to have a strategy, the scaling strategy that would that would also leave open the possibility of a of a private equity exit if she decided to go that way, and but if she did. Uh, she wanted to create it in a way that it would reward the family as well. And by family, we mean Reuben and sure. the kids. Yeah. And, and you know, I would say this, you know, a lot of times when we're talking with clients and we'll, we will take the the healthcare regulatory aspect of this for a second is they, the, especially these key employees, they want to find a way to reward them when they exit because they, although might not be an owner of the entity at the time, they want them to, to share in that. So they might be done through certain types of bonus pools or stock options, or um, actually giving them direct equity. Um, but as as everyone has heard us in other episodes, that can get complicated mm-hmm. because they're in the healthcare uh, world. For sure. Uh, well, so Dr. Partridge, actually what she had communicated was that she wanted Ruben to have a 30% stake in all the new medical spas that were open. Okay. And she also wanted Lori and Suzanne and Keith to each have 15% in these new locations. So you can see that she was going to be a minority owner in this scaled vision of all these new locations. Yeah, man, and it's starting to get a little complicated here. That seems like there's some math involved. Um, you still have this original practice, right? Right, yeah. So that's the the Partridge Family Facial Plastics Institute. Okay. Was it out of a bus by chance? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm assuming, you know, you didn't say it, but the original practice is still 100% owned by Dr. Partridge. Yeah, I probably should have said that earlier. Yes, she owns 100%. And for context, for our audience and myself, what state are they currently living in? Well, like all good entertainers, Brad, they're in California. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and now they, they want a different ownership for the expanded practice is what I heard. Yes. So, and, and as would have happened with you, I'm sure when she was explaining the vision, you know, my, my legal brain was going wild and uh, I definitely, she needed to have a whiteboard meeting. Yeah. And that, and audience members, y'all probably heard us talk about this before, but we love whiteboard meetings as an opportunity to really hear the vision of the, of our client or a client and then able to sketch out literally with pens and mm-hmm. on the on a whiteboard of here's your current structure, here's how the flow of funds would work, here is how you could see it, and they can visualize the next entities and ownership and flow of patients. So it's a great opportunity before you actually, you know, actually develop the actual documentation of of mapping out the vision of this new corporate structure. Yeah, and and so. Dr. Partridge had this critical moment in time where um, she had business reasons to revisit the corporate structure with the scaling of the business. But she, what she didn't realize, and I was, of course, identifying, is that there's also compliance reasons to consider uh, when you're when she with her scaled vision, scaling vision, uh, to look at the corporate structure. Yeah, and this brings us, I think, back to the myth uh, of. That's uh in that's good, bursting out of this particular story with the Partridge family. <laughs> Michael, is it fake or real? Corporate practice of medicine may affect the business structure of my med spa. It's real, Brad. Yes, it is real. Okay, I, that's that, that was the answer I was gonna give earlier when I said I think I knew the answer. Oh well, good. Yeah, I'm glad that you uh, you, you would have passed the test. Whew. We were yeah. I mean, Dr. Partridge is in the state of California. And she had implemented a strategy where non physicians, uh, Ruben and uh, can you remember who the other one was? The bus, Keith. They were the non, they were non physicians and non practitioners, not practitioners, yeah. And they were going to be owners. And California is a strong corporate practice of medicine state. It sure is. Well, Michael, that's a great story. I think what we can do right now is we can go to commercial and on the other side, we can talk about the legal implications 
of their story and more importantly, dive deeper into from a structuring perspective, how to address it with the corporate practice of medicine. Many business owners use legal counsel as a last resort rather than as a proactive tool that can further their success. Why? For most, it's the fear of unknown legal costs. Bird Adato's Access Plus program makes it possible for you to get the ongoing legal assistance you need for one predictable monthly fee. That gives you unlimited phone and email access to the legal team so you can receive feedback on legal concerns as they arise. Access Plus, a smarter, simpler way to access legal services. Find out more. Visit birdadato.com today. Welcome back to Legal 123s with Bird Adato. I'm your host, Brad Adato. I'm still sitting here with my co-host, Michael Bird. Now, Michael, this season's theme is fake or real. And, you know, we talk about today with uh, Dr. Shirley Partridge and the whole Partridge Family Facial Plastic Institute, which is not in a bus. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe just for those who, you know, kind of want to, after the commercial, just a little quick recap of what happened. Yeah, so – you know, as a recap, Dr. Partridge approached us and and, uh, and got on a call with me because she had had a very successful facial plastics practice for mm -hmm. the past 25 years. She had had med spas before med spas were a name right. and had this non-surgical side of the practice that had grown to the point where it, it the non-surgical revenues were equal to the surgical revenues. Wow. And, you know, I think part of the biggest reason she called is she has family and and Ruben yeah. who uh, has been with her the whole time and she had this sense of loyalty of wanting to reward them and it was really more of a reward for what they were going to do as opposed to for what had been done yeah. so she was she was looking at okay well I want to go and I want to go open multiple new med spas because I'm going to scale the business and um, that's going to create security for my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that's where she came from. And she had a vision to have kind of new ownership for the new locations, yet she was going to preserve kind of her ownership stake in the practice. And maybe ultimately, we didn't talk a lot about this, probably sell it, that side of things to the young surgeon that she was bringing on. Sure. And I think, you know, the story, as we caught at the very end, this is based out of California. So, uh, you know, audience members, as you know, every single state has a different way of looking at the rules and regulations, especially when it comes to, to CPOM. But California is a state that does have it. And the way they have, and by the way, for those who don't know, and they're the probably the, the, the strongest state when it comes to enforcement of CPOM, but for those who don't know, um, non-physicians actually can co-own a medical entity in the state of California. The terminology they use is allied health professionals, which there's a long list of different types of um, providers, and that could be anywhere from your, your PAs all the way down to certain social workers. So the list is pretty robust if you have a particular license but they're limited meaning that the physician still has to own ma um, the max the, um, or minimum 51 percent and they these other allied health professionals would own up to 49 percent which as to in the, today's story will definitely in, impact um, our pa and rn laura and and susan because they could own up to 49 percent of the actual med spas as they open them up but ruben and keith could not so, Michael, let's talk about the current the current climate of CPOM in California. What's going on there? Yeah, and you alluded to it a moment ago. So, uh, co corporate practice of medicine in California is is strong, but one of the things that we've always appreciated about it is it's been really clear. Like, yes, it's good. Very know, clear. We know what you can and you can't do according to the way the laws have been built. and and actually, the medical boards issued a lot of information over the years. And uh, and so it's it's been easier for us to guide our clients on what you know what the boundaries are and how you set these up. You alluded to the enforcement side of it, yeah, and that is chaos. That's why California, in many ways, is one of the hardest states to go into from a risk perspective. And you know, there's there's just a a lot of stuff bubbling under the surface oh, in yeah. California. Um, a couple of years ago, there was some legislation that that got almost it didn't get too far, but it got out there that would have effectively 
um, kill the MSOs, which we'll talk a little bit more about here. But it would have had a significant impact on the solution to the corporate practice of medicine. And uh, and then from an enforcement perspective, uh, not only is California, you know, kind of enforcement really strict about people doing things they shouldn't be doing, uh, they are starting to focus their attention on MSOs. And there just is, you know, an enforcement theme of looking hard at the activities of non-doctors involved in the business uh, uh, in the business of medicine and in the practice of medicine. And so it raises the risk profile, even though the laws are clear, you know, you have, it's not for the faint of heart. You yeah. have to understand kind of what you're getting into. Yeah. All good points. And and, and the point that I think is the, the most important of that is, is how aggressive they are about enforcing it. And there is no leeway in that. So when you're sitting there visit, visiting with Dr. Shirley Partridge, um, you, you obviously had to, help her accomplish her goals. So what did you utilize to make that happen? Yeah. So we talked about the MSO, which I alluded to a moment ago, that's the management services organization. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this is the most common solution to the corporate practice of medicine. And the idea is that you, in a corporate practice of medicine state, you have to have a professional entity that's either 100% owned by the doctor or this 5149 with the allied health professionals. Yep. Um, and so the way you deal with the Rubens and the Keiths is you create an MSO and that is called a management services organization. That entity can be owned by anyone. Yeah. And in that, in this particular case, you know, the idea was let's create an MSO for all these new locations with this, ownership table that I mentioned earlier, 30% yeah. to Ruben, 15% each to the kids, and then the rest to Dr. Partridge. And then we would have a medical practice that would still, in this case, be 100% owned by Dr. Partridge. And we would bring that kind of those two entities to life, bring the MSO model to life through a management services agreement. And so the, the idea here without getting too much of the weeds on the MSA is because it's really was a, how do we create a structure mm -hmm. that would effectuate what she's wanting to accomplish? And so we ended up having the old practice that was owned by Dr. Partridge. And then she had a new practice that was owned by Dr. Partridge. Mm -hmm. And then we had this MSO that I just mentioned to a mention. And so in this particular case, all the patients that they've had historically at kind of the home location where the surgical practice is and the original med spa is would still business as usual. Yeah. They would come in, they'd go when they open the new locations, it from a branding perspective would look the same, but they were actually patients walk were walking into a different medical practice entity. Mm -hmm. And that, that particular entity was being managed by this MSO owned by the band and their band manager. <laughs> yes. And, and, you know, and for our audience members, you know, we, we didn't want to dive too deep today in this episode on, on the inside the MSA, a couple of good quick, quick takeaways for your thoughts. Number one is a lot of times, especially in strong states, someone says, I just want my MSA and they get an MSA and they think that's, that makes them compliant because they have an MSO and a professional entity those hearing this for the first time, sorry, those, um, sorry, so those who have heard me say this a lot, it's a form and substance issue, and especially in strong states like California, where you want to make sure that that MSO is showing up and rendering certain services, and then that therefore the the management fee um, and all the costs associated, there is a a process that goes with that. Those who want to dive deeper into this. Obviously, we've done other shows in this. We actually have a um, MSO field guide out there that you can read about the function and why you need an MSO, and especially court practice of medicine states. I, I and 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 we will get back into the MSO world in, in another episode where we're going to dive a lot deeper into how they can be utilized. But Michael, how about your final thoughts? Well, I got. I I think I should get Doctor Partridge a bumper sticker that says, or for the kids, it says, "My mom conquered sea palm." <laughs> what do you think? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll make sure that's on her her Christmas list. Mm -hmm. Well, audience members, that is all the time we have today. Next Wednesday, we will continue our quest to determine a legal myth when we bring on our returning guest, Doctor Jonathan Kaplan, to help us unpack fake or real. 
it is legal to compound semi-glutide. Bertadato is providing this podcast as a public service. This podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Bertadato. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Please consult with an attorney on your legal issues.